Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Equipping Tuesdays. You know what it's about today. You've done your homework. If you haven't <laughs> done your homework, don't come to me. You better, you better go stand. Go and face the wall. Go and face the wall. <laughs> Not in my class, no. <laughs> Not in my class. You come okay. and I receive you as you are. The teacher's here, so I'll let the teacher take over. I'll let the teacher take over. <laughs> Bless you all. Thank you for coming. Um, wow, yes. Nice to see all you, all of you here. Um, and I'm just going to go straight in. I want you to do a little bit of a review just so that we can get a focus of what we are trying to achieve at this moment with these prayers, which are, you're going to get to know as confession, forgiveness, cancelling the debt and repentance, because it is aimed at a specific aspect of the human nature. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and go back to uh, the first uh, PowerPoint that I did. Um, so I'm just going to make this from current slide. Um, just go up, up, right. So the area we're working at on is specifically this area, our past experiences. So our brain remembers a lot of things. It remembers the hurts and our brain responds out of these hurts, which comes out and we see the problem of our experiences in our body. So our body shows us that there's something wrong with us. And uh, this is the specific area that those prayers are targeting, the area of what we can call our life scripts, or our um, yeah, subconscious, unconscious memories. So I'm just gonna stop that and I'm gonna go to today's uh, PowerPoint that I've prepared. Right, here we go. Share the screen um, from the slideshow from the beginning. Okay, here we go. Revive Living Waters Ministries. I hope you're feeling all revived today as we soaked in the waters of the Holy Spirit as we worshipped earlier today. Lovely music that we had today. Really beautiful. Right, so come on. There we go. There's our toolbox. And this is the fourth one in our toolbox. Right, I'm just trying to get this out of the way. Right. So we are looking at these four types of prayer. Confession, forgiveness, cancelling the debt, and repentance. And they need to be used as a, a set. Um, I very seldom do them individually when I'm working with people. I usually take them through these prayers um, because it's, 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 it forms a, a, a unit together of helping uh, people come to the point of allowing the Holy Spirit to transform them on the inside. So... Uh, We've done confession and forgiveness, and I'm just going to give a little bit of a review here so that we all are um, up to date what we're talking about. So the first thing was confession. Confession is just owning the condition that we are in. There is a thing in the body of Christ of avoidance, suppression, and controlling. Um, I'm a born again believer. I've got these horrible feelings. I'll just push them down. 
and we don't deal with them. And the problem is that eventually, at some point, you come to a, a place where this unresolved issue emerges. And I know there's a lot of, uh, and it's a very important point of not having negative confession. Owning something that I'm hurting, that I have resentment, that I'm bitter, that I'm angry, is not a negative confession. A negative confession is I'm a bad person. I'm useless. I'm hopeless. That is negative confession. But we need to own the stuff if we want to receive all that the Holy Spirit, uh, that our covenant wants to work through us to be the people of God that he created us to be. So it's this confession is just the owning and a realization that unless the Lord comes and changes us on the inside, we are going to remain stuck. This is the total surrender that we have to do. The next thing is forgiveness. Uh, we went through that last week. Forgiveness is an Merely a simple understanding, people do not know what they are doing. It doesn't mean you have to continue to accept it. It doesn't mean you don't, uh, that you mustn't address it. Yes, you must do these things. But forgiveness is this understanding and it starts creating a release in us and in the world around us. And now, we often have the statement that people say, um, I'll forgive, but I can't forget. Now that aspect is what we call resentment. And it's the emotional connection to the event, which we also need to let go. And this is what we're gonna be talking about. And then lastly, today we'll be talking about how do we begin to think differently and the process of thinking differently. We must remember that these prayers, uh, as we pray, are actually spiritual. And they have a spiritual dynamic and a spiritual outworking. And um, you will see today, as I share some stories, the impact and the power that uh, will happen when we are able to go to people, to sit with them, and gently lead them through whatever they are struggling with. It's not us being judgmental of them, it's us being understanding that we are all broken people and walking with somebody is what the discipleship process is about. We are Christ's ambassadors, we are to demonstrate Christ to a broken world. We are the first Bible that a lot of people ever see. And it's not about ourselves. It's all about him. And we are this link, this incredible privilege of being a link from the Heavenly Father to the person that the Heavenly Father can fulfill what is desired in this person. So that's a little bit of a review. And let us now start looking at cancelling the debt. Vital for unhooking ourselves from the hurts of the past. So when we, yes, let me just say this. In all the times that I've been in church since I've been saved, I've never ever heard anybody preach about canceling debts. Yet, it is vital. It's in the center of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus said, this is how you pray. He said in that prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And unfortunately, a lot of the Bibles have changed these words uh, into other words. And that's on the next slide. And the word debts is a word... Of Lima, which is something owed, legally due, an offense or an obligation. And when you look at your childhood, the child needs to be nurtured. 
loved, cared for, listened to, protected. And when that obligation is not fulfilled in our childhood, we often walk away out of our childhood into adulthood with resentment towards our parents. And it goes back to this fourth commandment, which is repeated in the New Testament, uh, honor your parents that it may go well with you. It's the only commandment with a promise. And I'll get a little bit into that at another stage. So what is a debt? Just to go through it. The word debt is often substituted with the words sin and transgression in the Bible. It's not sin. It's not transgression. Those are different Greek words. It's debt. It means something owed or due. Root word meaning to be under obligation or having morally failed in duty. So when our parents haven't nurtured us the way they should have, it's actually a moral failure. But we need to release and forgive that we can prosper. It is experienced as resentment resulting from unmet expectations. And you really know you've got a resentment when you're walking down the road and you see somebody coming towards you and the sale on the other side of the road seems to be more important than looking and meeting that person. When you've got that avoidance, there is something that needs to be worked through in our lives with the help of the Holy Spirit. And it has, you should have acted differently towards me. Now you owe me. That's what a debt is. So I've asked you to read Matthew 18, verse 15 to 35. And I'm just going to go through this from the top of my head. I'm not going to go into it by reading all the scriptures. It's got quite a long passage, and I'm just going to highlight something. Now, what I would like to suggest to you that when you go to the original man manuscripts, there is a gap in the manuscript between verses 14 and 15. And then as it begins chapter 19, there's another gap. So when our Bible was written originally, there weren't chapters, there weren't verses. It was just a whole a long piece of writing. And the sections were addressing a specific subject. Later on, they added the chapters and the verses, as just so that we can find them. And so I'm going to suggest to you that when we look at this chapter, Matthew 18, verses 15 to 35, to look at it as a whole around the subject of forgiveness and cancelling the debt. And unfortunately, our Bibles today have got a whole lot of subtitles in that. And we tend to just break it out into these little subtitles and make it into little things here and there. And don't often see the context in which it was or originally given to us. And it starts out, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and tell them their fault not their sin. This is what we tend to do. We go and tell people what they've done wrong. You've lied to me. That's not the fault. That's the sin. And to tell them their fault requires spiritual discernment. So the best way that I would like to try and give you an understanding of what a fault is, if you take the San Andreas Fault, this is the uh, tectonic plates on the western seaboard of the United States of America. There's these two tectonic plates, and they shift. And as they shift, the buildings on the top crack. So it's this underneath thing that is causing the buildings to crack. So when we have an earthquake, it's the shift of the tectonic plates underneath, but we see the result on top. That's the sin. The fault is what is underneath. And 
this whole passage goes on about taking another person and then going to the church. I'm not going to go into that too much. But it's about trying to reconcile, uh, reconciliate, to restore relationship, which is done through this forgiveness and cancelling the debt. If somebody is lying to you, it requires a little bit of discernment. Why is this person so unsure of who they are that they cannot tell you the truth? So when you start thinking that way, you're going in with compassion, you're going in with grace, you're going in with forgiveness, and you're going in with humility. And you are holding them and walking with them in their brokenness. The scriptures go on and they talks about where two are gathered together, where two agree on any, everything. And then verse 18 is the powerful one. It's also mentioned in the previous chapter, I think, but I'm just going to quote it. Um, it goes, and I'm just trying to get the words, it's just... Um, Right, it's just gone right out of my head. Um, if you may, um, oh, sorry, apologies. I just need to double check myself here. I've it's just gone, just gone blank for a moment, and I use this so many times. Um, welcome to the way our brains think. Uh, Matthew 18, there we go, right, it's, it's the scripture that says, I have given you the keys to the kingdom of heavenly happiness and power. So you can see how important forgiveness is, because it's the gateway, the keys not only to heavenly happiness and peace, but also to power. Whatever you bind on earth, and I'm going to make a suggestion that it's binding with resentment and judgment, is bound in heaven. It stops heaven from operating. And whatever we loose on earth through forgiveness is loosed and released in heaven and that starts allowing heaven to start doing things that are otherwise um, hindered through our unforgiveness and we can also take this passage and it goes on a little bit where peter suddenly pipes up and this gives you a very clear indication that this whole passage is about forgiveness how many times must I forgive? Seven times seven. Jesus' answer was, no, it's an ongoing, continuous process. We walk in forgiveness because we have been forgiven. So if somebody parks in the wrong place, we have to walk in forgiveness. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. And then follow in the Holy Spirit. We can help that person. And Jesus immediately goes on to this quite incredible little passage. He says that a king was going through his ledgers. And he comes against this guy that owes him a billion pounds. I'm just using a very large figure. I'm not doing an accurate translation of the actual amount. So he says, okay, I need to call this person in and say, hold on, you owe me this massive amount of money. And I can see that there's no ways you will be able to repay this amount of money. I'm going to sell you into slavery. Now we must understand what is the Jewish tradition behind this. So the Jewish tradition is there's a year of jubilee and every 
40th year, all debts are cancelled. So if you had a mortgage, it is written off. And people only gave uh, loans uh, when they uh, wasn't close to the year of Jubilee, because in that 40th year when the debts were cancelled, uh, you would just write off that amount that was owed. And this is a brilliant system, and if the world used it today, we wouldn't be in the problems that we are financially today. And now, the king says, you can't pay this. I'm going to sell you into slavery. Now, the concept here is to put somebody in a position till the year of Jubilee because he cannot pay it. So if you um, had borrowed money and you were going to invest it to bring in spices and you invested all the money in a ship and the ship went wherever to get the spices and was shipwrecked, you are now bankrupt. Rather than you being a liability on society, the person that gave you a loan would take you in and you would work for him free of charge till the year of Jubilee. But he would provide housing, he would provide accommodation, and he would provide food. So the whole society was looked at and so when the king said to this person who owed him the money, I'm going to put you and your family into slavery, it wasn't a horrible thing like the gallows that we've seen in the uh, various movies. It was a place of looking after people, which is the father's heart, when people land up in hard times. Anyhow, this guy says, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'll make a deal. I I'm sure I can make a plan. The king shakes his head and says, there's no ways. No ways you can do this. And he looks and he says, well, a couple of years times, the year of Jubilee, I'm going to cancel what you owe me straight away. So the guy goes there, his debt is canceled, he's free. And he's walking down the road and he sees a friend of his. And this friend owes him 10 pounds. And he says, I want my 10 pounds. The guy says, I haven't got it at the moment. I'm going to get paid at the end of the month. I'll give it to you then. The guy says, I am not interested. And he throws him into debtor's prison. Completely different scenario. The king, of course, hears about it and he says, what? brings him up and he said, should you have not had mercy like I had mercy on you? And in anger, the king threw him into prison to be tortured until he should pay all his debt. And verse 35 is the crunch one. And so will my heavenly father do to every one of you who do not forgive from the heart. And that's why forgiveness, cancelling the debt, is crucial. It's not an optional extra. And we need to own those things in our heart. And we need to go with somebody and go through these prayers. And that's why I'm giving you these prayers to allow them to be set free. Now, I want to tell you a story. Um, Margie and I had the privilege of having a mentor called John and Bev Sheesby. Uh, we met them um, and we learned a lot from them. They eventually went to the United States where they opened a uh, ministry called Liberated Living Ministries. And he was doing a he was a, invited to a church where he was preaching on this very chapter and verses and it come to the end of the service and a woman came to him who had been locked in depression she had gone to all the clinics no matter what 
they did, she couldn't get free from this depression. So John started ministering to her. And what emerged as he started ministering to her was that she, her, her mother-in-law did not like her one bit. As far as her in-laws were concerned, she was from the wrong side of the tracks, so to say. And the mother-in-law and the father-in-law would have nothing to do with her. Anyhow, she was married and her husband uh, was in the Marines and he had gone missing in action. I don't know whether it was Vietnam or what one of those wars, but he was missing in action. And this woman is very, very worried what has happened to her husband. The uh, Marine Corps find him and they extract him and he's safe. And they can't get hold of her for some reason. But they get hold of her mother-in-law and they say, listen, your son is safe. But because the in-laws do not like her, they refuse to let her know that her husband is safe. What happens? She finds out and she has this intense resentment towards them. So John leads her through all the prayer work. And... He says to her, he sends by the Holy Spirit, this is what I feel the Holy Spirit is saying. He's saying that I, I want you to forgive your mother-in-law. And what I would like you to do is to ring her and ask her for forgiveness because you had judged her. You don't have to give the details. You just have to say, mom-in-law, I've judged you. Please forgive me. She says to John, my in-laws are new ages. They think us Christians have lost the plot completely. They don't want to have anything to do with me. If I phone my mother-in-law, she will just slam the phone down. Well, John says, this is what I feel the Holy Spirit has said. So she goes, and it's the next day. And when you've been challenged by the Holy Spirit, there's this wrestle. And she's putting it off, and she's putting it off. Putting it off. Late afternoon, she says, oh, I just got to do this. Picks up the phone, phones the mother-in-law, says to the mother-in-law, I'm sorry, I've judged you. Will you please forgive me? The mother-in-law says, what? You don't need our forgiveness. You Christians are freaky and slams the phone down. She walked away saying, that's exactly what I said would happen. But remember the scripture. What we lose on earth is loosened and released in heaven. It took 20 minutes. Suddenly the telephone rings. She picks it up. It's her mother-in-law. Mother-in-law says, and this is quote unquote from the testimony, I don't know what has happened, but I feel like I've been let out of prison. Out of that conversation, they became friends and eventually led both of them to the Lord. And obviously, she was released from a depression. This is so powerful. And I've done it many times and I've seen the same results. As I followed this, I did this with a woman back in South Africa. It was a Saturday. Her father never ever found her. We went through these prayers. Monday morning, she rang me. She said, you can't believe it. 
this morning. For the first time, my father phoned me. So, remember, John 20, verse 23. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So here's the prayer that I use quite regularly. And I'm going to go through the prayers and I've asked, oops, sorry, back one. I've asked Remy to post these prayers on our uh, Zoom fellowship. It's a set of four prayers. It's in a PDF, uh, not a PDF. It's a, um, uh, a Word document. You print them out and I suggest you keep them and use them as appropriate. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Forgive me for my judgment against in your name and any other person who has not ex met my expectation when it came to. And this is where I work with the person about what their expectation is. When we formulate some words, and it might be um, not letting me know that my husband was safe, excluding me, rejecting me, whatever. Now, Heavenly Father, if I find that someone does not treat me correctly from now on, now on it doesn't matter. Now, that is really letting go. In other words, it's giving them permission to continue to do exactly what they're doing. But we can only do this because the next part of the prayer says, I can only say this because you, Heavenly Father, have promised me by your new covenant with Jesus, of which I am a partaker, to provide all my needs, to take care of me and protect me. I now commit my life and decisions to you. And you have promised me, promised to guide me. So when you've got resentment, you're holding something in your hand. Think about it that way. God can't put anything. We've got to let it go and go to him with empty hands for him to fill it. I now release, cancel, and annul any debt that I feel is owed me. I cancel every word, thought, or deed, and judgment on my part against anybody or person or thing regarding this which I feel is owed me. I set myself free from its influence over my family and me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for it is written. You are able to cause things to happen immediately. Beyond and abundantly above all I ask for. Desire, able to comprehend or perceive. And you do it by the miraculous and powerful Holy Spirit within me. I now want to talk about a little bit on repentance. It's a very short prayer, but we've got to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And in many times, we have a wrong way of thinking, um, especially when you feel I'm useless, I'm bad, I'm not good enough. And sometimes I don't use this prayer, depending on the circumstances and how the Holy Spirit leads. But Sometimes we need to start thinking differently about ourselves. So let's just have a quick look at repentance in the Old Testament. Nacham. Returning to the Lord with sorrow and being spared from God's wrath. Now remember the Hebrew nation was under the law of Moses 
and it was a law uh, 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 of a works thing. But under the new covenant, the Greek word is metanoia, um, being transformed by the renewing of our mind, metanoia, having a new insight on an issue, and because of a new understanding, we can choose to think and act differently or behave differently. So it's this light bulb moment that we are looking for. Oh, that's what I'm doing. So what is the process? It can be immediate, but it can also take time. So this process of thinking differently, of being transformed by the renewing of our mind can be instantaneous, but it can also take a bit of time. Hence, I spoke about in that earlier talk, specifically the first one of the series of how these unconscious, subconscious memories are locked into our brain, into our body. So in our brain, we have neural pathways. These are ways that our brain will think. It's just very, very much automatic. And we need to change these neural pathways. And specifically, we need to work on them. So a nice way to think of this, if you've got a field and there is a path that people are walking along, and this path where they've walked, you can see there's no grass growing. You want to have a new path. So the first time you walk in a new direction, you can see the grass bent over, but within a day, it's back to like there was no path. But you do it again, and you do it again, and you do it again. And eventually, a track begins to form, a new track. And eventually, it becomes the new pathway. And eventually the old pathway seems to regenerate itself and eventually can almost disappear. So that is a process. And it generally, if you do it proactively, you can do it in 28 days. If you do it just generally, you take you about three months to learn to start responding, acting differently. Um, I'm talking about the way we speak, the way we respond, and the many things that we tend to do. This is something that I learned from Margie um, when she was trying to do something differently. She went to the Holy Spirit and said, Holy Spirit, just touch me on the shoulder so that I don't do it the old way, but I do it the new way. And you have that thought come up of the old pattern of thinking. And then he just touches you gently on the shoulder and they say, OK, and then you start speaking out the new way proactively. When change does not seem to be forthcoming, ask if there is a deeper or another unresolved issue. So sometimes our process of healing is something like an onion. It, there's the outer layer, we take the outer layer off, we do the confession, forgiveness, cancelling the debt, and then there's another layer, and then there's another layer, and there's another layer. And eventually we come back to there's nothing left. So it can take a bit of time, but this is most important. At no time do we allow self-criticism or think that we must try harder or that we are not forgiven. So even this is a renewing of your mind for some of you. This will only lead to a downward spiral of self-effort and self-effort nullifies the work of the Holy Spirit. And the scriptures of Zion that is the filthy rags one. I can't remember exactly what John 15 says, but it's all about this. When we are renewing the mind, do not beat yourself up. Okay. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We just go through the process and the Holy Spirit will eventually 
allow us to be transformed through his power internally. And one day you'll be different. And you won't be able to take any glory because the glory belongs to the Father. The Father said in the Old Testament, I will not share my glory with another. It doesn't mean we mustn't ask, but we cannot take credit for the work. It has to be to him. So this is the little repentance prayer that I pray or get people to pray, and I work on it quite carefully. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you and confess that I have a wrong I have wrong attitudes and a wrong way of thinking about. And we need to think a little bit always when we are taking somebody through this. What is actually the wrong way of thinking or the wrong attitude? And let's use this uh, idea of um, I'm useless. It's not working. That, that's a wrong way of thinking because you're not useless. You've just got this way that God has created us to function and it needs to be transformed. So I have a wrong way of thinking about I'm unable to change and I'm useless. Please forgive me for my wrong attitudes and a wrong way of thinking. And the prayer goes on. I ask that you, by your Holy Spirit in me, will open my eyes, open the eyes of my heart to see things from your perspective. Give me your revelations. Now, people often try and repeat the first bit. I never repeat the first bit. I go with a new concept here. Please give me your revelations that I am a child your precious child, and that you love me. So I often bring in something new, and this has to be done by the Holy Spirit, so that my new understanding, my attitudes and thinking of, are changed. Lord, I thank you for purifying my heart. Amen. So we are now into questions and answers.